Forecast as software engineer at Igalia. Igalia is a, is a small consultancy specialized in open source. We work in mostly in browsers, but we do other stuff on graphics, on, on multimedia, and also we have a team that works on networking. And this talk is very much related with the talk that Costas Thorpe but the Elos deliver on the plenary session on, on Tuesday. He talked about Lightweight for over six, their experiences deploying it at OT in Greece. And this talk is the story of the data plane that they were using. Uh, I can provide more context on how we get involved into this project. Uh, we started the networking team and we were working with a data plane, uh, a toolkit for developing data plane that is called Snap. And at some point we get in contact with Ian Farder that is one of the authors of Lightweight Forever 6. And he asked us if we were interested in developing an open source solution uh, of the ARC. Uh, we evaluated, we say yes. Um, the reason why they wanted to have an open source uh, implementation of this standard is because they are using it in their next generation network at Deutsche Telekom, there is called TerraStream. It's an IPv6 only network, and for providing IPv4 connectivity, uses Lightweight Forever 6. So I have divided the talk in two parts. Uh, the first part, I'm going to talk about the Lightweight 04 over 6, a high level view, especially comparing it with dual stack light because it has many things in common. I'm also going to talk about carry grid NAT. And the other half of the talk, I'm going to cover open source implementations of Lightweight 4 over 6. So when, when I try to explain to my friends like what, I, what I'm doing these days, um, and I tell them that I work on IP6 transition technology, usually they ask me like, why somebody's interested in IPv6 transition technology, why not just deploying IPv6? And, and that, that's a good point, that's dual stack light. If you do that, you don't need an IPv6 transition technology. But um, that's in theory how things should have, wor should, should have worked, but it didn't happen that way. So we need mechanisms that is the transition to IPv6. And there are two possibilities there. You either provide IPv6 connectivity on an IPv4 only network, with technologies such as 6RD or a tunnel broker, the Hurricane Electric, for example, or you have an IPv6 only network and provide IPv4 connectivity to your customers. And this is where I think the industry is going um, with things such as dual stack light or lightweight forever 6 or 464 XLAT. It simplifies things much. You don't have to configure things twice. You don't have to troubleshoot problems twice. You just have your IPv6 network. Um, and offer IP4 connectivity to your customers. For example, Deutsche Telekom, Terrestrian, Verizon is doing the same in the US for the 4G mobile network, it's IPv6 only. Comcast is delivering TV to their customers on an IPv6 only network. But since we know some years ago, in 2011, APNIC ran out of IPv4 public addresses and then the other risks follow, and ISPs, um, they needed to accommodate to a higher demand of customers with the same pool of IPv4 addresses. So they start to do NAT on their networks. From a logical point of view, a aggregate NAT is the same NAT network function we have been running at the CPEs. Uh, a NAT network function maps one address domain, usually a private address, to another address domain, a public address. It is stateful, it needs to keep a per flow information of this mapping and NAT is a man in the middle. It breaks the end-to-end -end principle of the internet before the 90s, all addresses were public, and it also needs to recalculate TCP and IP checksums since it changes the addresses on the ports. This is not very uh, uh, demanding in computational power if you're doing on your CPE, but when you're doing it for a large amount of customers, it is something. So this is how a NAT works. It maps um, an IP a private address to a public address, and now we need to create a binding and entry in this binding table of this mapping. This is how Carrigate NAT works. We have this laptop, we have a private address, we want to reach the internet, IPv4, we go to a CPE, performs a NAT, now we got this new address. This is like a private address that the IAT um, standardized is like a private address in the one, then we reach uh, the CGN that is deployed at the current network, translate this, this address to a public address, so we have one binding entry at the CPE and another one at the carrier. Since we don't have any control of what's going on at the carrier network, NAT44, carrier NAT, 
makes more difficult to host services in our client networks, and it also breaks many applications. Another inconvenience is that it's a stateful, so that means that it's hard to scale. And since now there are many users behind the same IPv4 public address, we have this problem of complying with uh, law enforcement. We, uh, when we, they ask us to identify who's the user behind uh, IP address. So to solve some of the problems of carrying that, uh, people start to think maybe we should move to IPv6 to alleviate the demand of IPv4 public addresses on our pool. So dual stack light, what proposes is an IPv6 only network and is going to facilitate IPv4 connectivity over this IPv6 only network. A dual stack light architecture consists of two endpoints, two network functions. One, oh sorry, <laughs> I want to go back. Okay, one of these network functions is called the B4. The B4 is going to encapsulate packets at the CPE and the other network function is deployed at the carrier and is going to perform the carrier net. This is how it works. We are this laptop, we want to reach the IPv4 internet. Our packet reached the CPE. The CPE is not going to do a NAT. There's some confusion here. In dual stack light, the CPE doesn't do a NAT, just encapsulates the packet in IPv6. Then finally, our packet reaches a barter router that executes the after network function. And the network function, what it's going to do is two things, decapsulate the packet and perform the NAT. And then forward the packet to the internet. B4 stands for Basic Bridging Broadband, runs at the CPE, is a tunnel endpoint, encapsulates IPv4 packets in IPv6, and it also acts as a DNS proxy. To, is it possible to resolve air records using IPv6? Users could also use their own DNS, but that will make requests to the after, stress the after, so it's also possible to get the DNS resolved by native IPv6. And then the after it means address family translation router. It runs at the carriers network, is the other tunnel endpoint, decapsulates IPv4 and IPv6 packets, and is going to perform a NAT on the packet. So when it does the NAT, it needs to keep an entry as the one that you saw before, but this time it's also, it needs to have an extra field to know to which TPE it has to send the packet when it comes back. Advantages and inconvenience of dual stack light is tunnel based. We can deploy the tunnels, can be anywhere in the network. Makes sense that it's at the edges of the network. Removes one level of NAT. There is no NAT at the CPE. It's meant to be deployed at IPv6 only networks. One inconvenient is that um, as anything we'd have to do with encapsulation, it has to deal with fragmentation and reassembly. If our IPv4 packets is the maximum size of the MTU, and in addition, we put the 40 bytes of an IPv6 header, the after has to handle this fragmentation and assembly. This is something specified in the standard. And another inconvenient is that it's stateful because it uses a carry grid NAT. So to solve these problems, there were some suggestions on dual stack light that finally became a new RFC, is 7596, a lightweight four over six. So Lightweight 4 over 6, what it tries to do is to remain the stateful nature of dual stack light. And for doing that, it's going to do two things. It's going to move the NAT back to the CPE. And as dual stack light, it also relies on two network functions. Now the before is called the... Sorry. Ah. The B4 is called lightweight before and it's going to do two things, a NAT and encapsulation, and the after is called lightweight after. And it's going to do a software lookup and decapsulation. You may wonder what is a uh, software. So the way that lightweight for over six shares IP addresses among customers is different. It's not going to do a NAT. What it's going to do is it's going to give a portion of the port space to each customer. So instead of having a customer the 65,000 ports that we usually have, maybe we're going to have 1,024 ports. This is how it works. We are this laptop, we want to reach the IPv4 internet. Our packet reaches the CPE. The CPE is going to do an NAT and it's going to encapsulate the packet in IPv6. The packet gets routed until it reaches a border router. 
and the brother writer executes the lightware after function. Lightware after is going to do a lookup in a binding table. This binding table is static, it's not dynamic, it's already created. And if there is a match, it's going to decapsulate the packet and forward it to the internet. So software is, is something, it, a software maps uh, two different address families, IPv4 and IPv6. It's not exclusive of lightweight for over six, it's used also by, by MAP-E or MAP-T and 6RD. And this is how an entry in the binding table looks like. We have an IPv4 public address, a port range, and the IPv6 address of the CPE. This is the YAN schema of a software. It is the three fields that I said before. There is also the address of the after. This is needed for provisioning. And the port, actually, it doesn't work like a minimum value and a maximum value. It's not encoded like that. I'll explain what this means. So a port is a 60-bit number. So in this port set field, we are going to say how we're going to use the 16 bits to have a size of the port set, like 1024, and then the rest of the bits, we can use it for the number of port sets. Uh, in this case, 6 and 10, that means that I'm going to have port sets from 0 to 1023, 1024, 2014, and then I encode the port set of a software with an identifier. So port set identifier 8, it actually corresponds to these values. Another cool thing of softwares is that you don't necessarily need to do the same split for the same IP4 addresses. You can have different splits. For example, in the first case, we do this division of 1,024 per set size. Then imagine that usually a question that I got is like, oh, what happened with the privileged ports? The standard recommends not to allocate the privileged ports, the ones that go from zero to 1,024 to any customer. But if a customer wants to host services, what you're going to do is you give them a full IP4 address. And also if a customer has a big client network, you can give them a wider uh, port set, like 16,000 ports. Another cool feature of Lightweight 4 over 6 is her pinning. Imagine that you are this computer here and you want to reach a website which just happens to be host in the same carried network. So what's going to happen is your packet gets routed to the after and when the after looks, does a lookup, it realizes that the destination of this packet is within their network. So it just sends the packet back to the client. It doesn't decapsulate and send it to the internet because if that's that, it's going to come back anyway. So there's a document called Deployment Considerations for Lightweight 4 over 6. Uh, it's a study from China Telecom and Tsinghua University. And among other things, they test several applications and apparently many of them work. But this is an experiment. What it really matters are real use cases, like the one that OT is doing. They are deploying it for real in a production environment, and there's when uh, the ISPs can get really good feedback. So it would be awesome, like if you are a, a, you belong to an ISP, that you take this software and try to at least uh, test it in in your labs. Pros and cons: the advantage of lightweight for over six is that removes the carrier net and that makes Lightweight for over six stateless. And when you are stateless, you can uh, scale much easier. If you need more uh, uh, to cope with more demand, you just throw more afters to your network. And the inconvenient is as, as dual stack light, it has to handle fragmentation and reassembly. So about open source implementations, first thing first, the B4. The B4 is available in a program called NAP. Is on OpenWRT, so if your CPUs are running OpenWRT, it is supported. But if not, this function actually is not very complicated. It can be emulated using commands such as IP root 2 for creating the tunneling and IP tables for doing the NAT. There is a, an article by Marcel Wigget, uh, there is a Juniper engineer that uh, did uh, participate in the deployment at OT, and that he describes how to implement that before using Linux commands. About the after itself, there are right now, as far as I know, two open source implementations. One is from BPP, Vector Packet Processing. This is a toolkit for fast data planes by Cisco. And the other one, the other one is in SNAP, the one that Igalia implemented. There is a nice talk, but Ole Tron is a Cisco engineer. He talks about BPP and with the specific examples of lightweight after. 
and about snaps like we're after. Uh, how many of you are familiar with user space networking, things like DPDK or BPP? Okay, more or less. So a snap is similar to DPDK or BPP. It's a toolkit for developing data planes. It was started in 2012 by Luke Gorey. It's similar to DPDK and BPP, as I said. And what it does is a kernel bypass. Actually, all these toolkits do the same thing. They bypass the kernel, they talk directly to the hardware, to get the maximum performance. One particularity of a SNAP is that it's written in Lua, and it's run with LuaJ, that is very performant um, virtual machine. So this is what we use for developing uh, the, the light we're after. About uh, software-defined networking, well, forget all the best. This is about making hardware appliances more programmable, and there's two approaches for that. You can do x86, you build something that is equivalent to a high-end Cisco Juniper router, and then you do your programming. Or you can go the other way, that is using programmable ASICs, like these barefoots that now are programmable using P4. So Snap goes this way, x86. Hardware right now is good enough uh, for building something that is equivalent to a high-end Cisco router. We have NICs that goes from 10G, 40G, 100G, Intel, Mellanox. PCI bandwidth is not a problem anymore, 32 gigabytes per second, and new versions are coming with more bandwidth, and we have tons of processing power, uh, like architectures with 12 and up to 48 uh, cores. So we can build a commodity of the shell network appliance and then program our data, data planes. But if you do that and you use like, something like Linux, the bad news is that Linux, because um, how it's built, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work well as a forwarding plane. Whenever there are packet reached the NIC, there is an intergroup and that has to go through the networking layer until the reaches user space and you do your thing. And that has a cost and the great performance. And that's why all this user space networking movement started some years ago. But however, there is an update. Kernel people has not been idle and they have tackled this problem. And now there is a new layer in the kernel that is called XDP, Extreme Data Path, that borrows many of the ideas of user space networking. Um, uh, now it's possible to attach programs to uh, an XDP interface. And as soon as a packet is received in the NIC, you can run your network function. So we are going to see really cool things coming in the kernel about uh, high-performance networking. Okay, about a SNAP. This is the toolkit that we used for programming the data plane. I'm going to explain what it is. It's very easy. A SNAP consists basically of three things. Apps that represent network functions, such as a filter or the light we're after. Links that are going to connect these apps together. And programs. And programs are interfaces with dealing with this graph of connected apps. Okay, so we can have a program that uses uh, Intel NIC and whatever comes out from the Intel NIC, we're going to pass it to a filter and whatever comes out from the filter, we pass it to a pickup app that is going to write down these packets to a file. Then once we have this program, this uh, graph or uh, apps, we pass it to a snap engine and snap engine is going to execute it in breaths. It, each breath consists of two steps. Inhaling is going to pull packet from one or several sources and put them in the links and processing. It's going to give a chance to apps to do something with those packets in their incoming links. For instance, this is a, a program in Snap. We create a configuration. We instantiate our NICs, our, sorry, our apps. There's a NIC, a filter, a pickup app, then we connect them together, as we saw before. We pass this configuration to an engine, and we run it. Then each app, it has a push method, and this push method is what it gives the app to do something with packets. So I'm going to read the packets in the input link. I'm going to receive them. I do something with them, like applying a filtering expression. If it matches, I transmit this packet. I forward this packet to the next app. If not, I can drop it. And with these basic elements, these primitives, actually you can build any network function. The lightware after network function we built is a combination of these small steps, but it's more, much more sophisticated. So about the development, we started um, like in 2015, delivered the first version in October. 
And this version was mostly like a prototype. We wanted to test that it worked. So we implemented basic encapsulation, decapsulation. We worked with a small binding table with a custom format. We achieved a performance of two million packets per second with 550 byte packets. For doing this development, we have to develop our own tools for measuring performance, like something that um, passes a load to the function, ramps up, and see at what point we start to lose packets. Also, we needed to um, validate that we implemented the standard correctly, so we had lots of end-to-end -end tests. Another features we implemented were, were fragmentation and reassembly, rate limiting, ingress and ingress filters. Version two, this is the one that is actually production ready. It is full complaint, complaint with RFC 7596. It uses large binding tables. Still with a custom formance, uh, format, we try out with one million softwares. We reach it uh, line rate performance on a 10G NIC card. We also implemented some control plane, uh, snap locket libraries for dealing with R packets, with NDP, with PIN. It was required that we needed to, for example, in the interfaces of the lightware after, the IPv4 side, the IPv6 side. Also, we managed to run it as a BNF. Uh, the performance was a little bit lower, but it's still very good. Um, more things that we did was more, more tests, continuous integration. We improved our tools, VLAN tagging. And actually, this is the version that it is deployed at OT. Um, as Costas uh, explained it in his talk, uh, Juniper took this data plane and they plug it together with Junos for providing the needs for the control plane. And what you see here is actually a SNAP program. This is the network function I were after as alone. And this is the, an Intel NIC. And then uh, Juniper engineers, mostly Marcel, he called these um, applications that is split packets, uh, fragmentation, this net for, for forwarded. How it works is like, Whatever packets are data plane are passed to the lightware after, and anything that is control plane is sent to a virtual machine that is running Junos that is going to resolve like BGP packets, uh, ARPs, NDPs, and send them back. We learned a lot of things while working in this project, especially about uh, performance. Uh, it was necessary to meet the performance criteria. Uh, so things that we learned was profile heavily, like because we were running on a virtual machine, we got to check there was no interpreted code. Everything has to be jitted. Also use tight loops, so you are not either, you're always doing something. The downside is that the CPU is used at 100%. Also use single instruction, multiple data, things like ABX or ABX2 instructions. Emit your own assembly if you need it. And about environment, um, if you are working on a data intensive application, Make sure that you use huge spaces. Also disable hyper-threading because it can thrust performance. New awareness, this was something that we completely ignore. Um, make sure that when you run your application, your devices and your cores are in the same NUMA node. And another thing is isolate the CPUs. Don't let that your uh, operating system uh, dispatch other applications in the CPUs where you're running uh, your program. Then version three came out in the end of 2016. Um, it added the YAN support, it was very nice. Now any SDAP application can use YAN. We re-architecture the program. Now we have, we run it in two process, a leader and a worker, because for this big bandy table, there is a certain program that is going to use netconf commands to feed it. And so there is a leader program that deals with netconf and the worker just runs the data plane. So we can go uh, at very fast speed. And then version four, we implemented RSC on RSS on the Intel NIC. This allows you to, if you have a load distributed among different cores, so we can do multi-processing. Now there is one leader and end workers that don't run the data plane, and we got support for the alarm model as well. About adoption, the project is very much linked with uh, Deutsche Telekom TerraStream, the generation network, they're using Lightweight for overseas there but it also can be used in any other network. For example, Greece is deploying it at, uh, OT is deploying it in Greece. Conclusions. Lightweight for over six is an iteration over dual stack light, implements IPv4 as a service in IPv6 only networks. It relies on A plus B softwares. 
It is a stasis, which makes it very easy to scale, and there are full-fledged open source implementations available today. There's a collection of links, and I can take uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Diego. Ilyich. Hi, my name is Ilyich Benham. Um, so, I have two thoughts. On the one hand, I'm impressed that you got so, so much cool stuff done. On the other hand, I'm depressed that you spent so much time to keep this old crappy uh, IPv4 protocol uh, running. And <laughs> you, you really should check your working groups because this is the IPv6 working group, not the legacy IPv4 working group. Sorry, what's the question? You, you, you think that it's a pity that it took so much time to do what? Well, you, all this energy, you spend it on keeping yeah. IPv4 working. That is sad. No, well, no. I mean, well, yeah, I understand. It would be great <laughs> that everything would be IPv6, but uh, I think that for a real IPv6 transition, uh, ISPs are going to rely on IPv6 transition technologies that need to provide IPv4 connectivity to their customers. So this is what the project does, is a mechanism for doing this thing, which actually, I think, like if you compare, for example, CGN, like it's really expensive, these middle boxes, right? And now we have this solution that is open source, and you can buy a commodity of the shell a piece of hardware. This costs like maybe 5,000 US. Right, and I'm very impressed with it. It's really cool. It's just so mm. sad that it's still needed. Yeah, yeah, it would be great. Everything will be IP6. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just a comment on Hi, Blake Willis from Eyebrows. So Hi. first of all, thank you very much for presenting this. Um, I've banged around on it a little bit in the lab, actually. Um, just a quick uh, request, actually. If in your slides on uh, carrier grade NAT, um, could you please be sure in the future to use um, a ratio of like eight to one or 16 to one, like no more than 4,000, no less than 4,000 blocks per user in your examples. I know that this is just an example and you're not making a suggestion, but people still copy paste it a lot. And- uh, 4,000 blocks. Uh, 4,000 ports per block, yeah. Um, like eight to one to a 16 to one ratio as recommended by Europol, Belgian and French authorities so that they don't 16. have to trace a single ah, IP to, to 64. Ah, information that yeah. uh, no more than 16 users under the same IPv4 public address. Yeah, the, okay. the police have literally begged us not to do 64 mm. users per IP, so they don't have to trace 64 different IP uh, users per IP address. Okay, thank Thanks. you for the suggestion. I will change the slides. Thank you. I will add it to the slides. <coughs> um, uh, okay. Costa Sorbadelos from OTE. Uh, a comment, a small comment to the previous commenter. You can always hire them to do something more interesting and fun. And uh, for Diego, thanks very much for your very interesting work. Uh, keep up the very good work. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm sure all the team appreciates it too. Um, Benedict Stockebrand, Stepletter IT. Thank you very much. Uh, I largely agree with Ilyich that we shouldn't waste time on transition technologies which tend to uh, just um, delay the inevitable and make it more painful in the, when it actually happens. But um, considering the trouble a lot of people have with DS Lite, this might actually kind of help in uh, in number of situations. And having this open source is definitely a very good move. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Jan. Jan George. Um, so thank you for this very nice work. Um, you mentioned MAP and you mentioned Lightweight 4 over 6. Mm. And from, uh, from, from Monday when, when uh, Costas presented what they implemented in, in, in real life, I sense the increased um, uh, interest from operators to do something similar. Mm. But they're a little bit confused. Should we go MAP? Should we go Lightweight 4 over 6? Mm. So can you please elaborate, elaborate a little bit more so people would understand in which case you should use lightweight 4 over 6, in which case you should go for a map? Uh, I think I don't know much about map E, um, but I think it's very similar to lightweight 4 over 6. And I think what is happening is that this is a very early stage for these uh, other approaches of doing uh, softwares A plus B. Uh, and sometimes what is happening is like, 
this is a time to try things out. And I think that eventually one of them will be the most relevant. But at this moment, I think it's good to try different things. So do you plan to add uh, dynamic allocation of additional ports in Lightweight 4 over 6? If we plan to do dynamic allocation of... Of additional ports. So if, 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 if a user runs out of ports, uh -huh. because this was specified in a stateful A plus P, that is basically lightweight 4 over 6. And please stop saying that it's stateless, because it's stateful. Um, uh, do you plan to... Why do you say that it's a state? Why do you say it's a stateful? Because the softwares are per subscriber, are not per connection. You have bindings. Yeah, but the binding... Uh, it, that, it doesn't matter. It's stateful. I mean, you, I, because it's stateful because it depends on. Dude, I mean, for me, it's like I carry red NAT. It's stateful because once you establish this binding table that is dynamic, all the connections have to go through the same NAT. But the, in the in the afters, there is a big binding table that all the afters share, and it doesn't matter if you as exercise as certain subscribers or not. It doesn't matter. So okay. I'm, my my question is if if you are planning to add the the dynamic allocation of additional ports, because some people may, may, uh, may use it. Uh, I'm not familiar with um, what, what it means, and we, we'll explore it. But so far okay. at this moment, where we, the work that we are tackling is we have managed to be able to compile larger binding tables. Now we can have uh, up to 40 million uh, software binding tables. And that's uh, what we are doing right now. We we'll keep on working on the project, definitely, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think Costas has something to add. Yes, uh, in regards to this, um, the binding table in Lightweight 4 over 6 is more or less fixed. I think an idea for that is to have different binding tables and different offerings, so you could switch the user from uh, 1,024 ports, let's say, to something larger. Look, the binding table, so, I mean, it's not... this is what we are also considering in terms of... And uh, also, the binding board. table, maybe because I went very fast at the end, but uh, the binding table, it, it can be updated. It's not that it's fixed that you never change it. Through netconf, with netconfig comments, you can uh, interact with this leader process that had access to the binding table, and you can remove uh, software, add a new one, etc. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, responding, responding somehow to the first question from Jan, uh, there is not that much difference between MAPT, MAPI, and Lightweight 4 over 6. Most of the time is a decision which may be based on what is your network uh, equipment supporting and what the CPs are supporting. Uh, on the other side, if I am, I have done a, um, a comparison between all the transition mechanisms, and uh, I am happy to share the link, uh, the link to the latest slide in, in, in the list because they are in English. But I, I presented those in, in the last lightning meeting uh, in the tutorial, um, so you can actually see why one or the other has some or less advantages. But especially in those cases where you may have also a cellular network, or you may want to offer an hybrid service like, for example, broadband and cellular backup, uh, instead of going to any of those transition mechanisms, I would recommend to go to 464XLAT. Okay, any further comments, questions? If not, then this session is about to be ended, but at six o'clock we have um, Above in this room about IP and uh, ASNs for governmental issues. They have some governmental issues with getting IPv6 blocks, I've heard.